Good morning. <laughs> Got some visitors with us this morning, and we're glad wherever you came from that you're here with us. And uh, we're glad to be here as well. Glad to be alive on a beautiful day. The idea of salvation in the New Testament, being redeemed from sin and darkness and death, there's a, there's a Greek verb that's used that lays behind that idea of salvation. So, so. And the basic meaning is to be delivered. It's deliverance. And then in the, in the New Testament, in the Christian era, we took that concept and, and brought it into the spiritual realm to mean salvation from the penalty of sin. It's a very legitimate meaning. But when you see it in the Old Testament, in the, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, it's called the Septuagint, and you see that the idea of uh, deliverance, Israel being delivered from her enemies, and David delivered Israel, etc., etc. You see it many, many times. Obviously, that's not spiritual salvation. David is not their Messiah, but he was their warrior king. When they were delivered by God from their enemies, they were saved physically. Our God is a God of redemption, who through the cross of Jesus Christ purchases us out of the slave market of sin, but he's also a God of deliverance. And there is an ongoing work of redemption in each of our lives. For those who humble themselves before him and before his will, God is constantly at work. He's shaping, he's refining, he's molding. He's drawing impurities out of us, and he is pouring his love and his mercy and his compassion into us if we're willing to receive it. Ron, if we're willing to receive it. So I simply say that to say, let's reframe our idea a little bit. Not about salvation, which is a a once and for all transaction when you choose to trust in the work of the cross the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Let's remember that our God is redeeming our lives constantly. That he's healing, he's renewing, shaping our souls into his image. We were made that way to begin with, but then we fell. The human race chose against God. That's, <laughs> that one's not on God. That one's on us, purely on us. So we're in the condition we're in because we chose to rebel. But remember, our God is a God of, again, not just redemption, but of restoration, bringing something back to its original condition. He wants to heal the wounds, the pains, the hurts, and everybody in this room has them. Every, every soul here has a story behind it. Some of us know each other's stories, and they're, they're brutal. They're ugly. They're moments of beauty, but there's some real, there's some real pain there. Serious, serious, heart-searing pain. And our God wants to not only heal that, but to use it ultimately for your good and his glory, and he can. That is the guarantee, not just a, a sideline promise, but an in-the-game guarantee in Romans 8, 28, that God causes, not accidentally, he causes all things to work together for the good, the divine and ultimate good. All things, pain, sorrow, rejection, loss, abuse, abandonment, betrayal, your own sin. There's no way, no way. Abuse, abandonment, betrayal, my own Sins and crimes and misdeeds, missteps, mistakes. Yep, everything. All things is, a, is a, an inclusive concept. Everything causes these things to work together for the good. To those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. The calling is our entrance into a relationship with God through our faith in him. The loving him constantly, continually, that's a lifestyle. That's our practice, day by day, moment by moment. And you would ask, if you ask the vast majority of believers, probably in the United States, do you love God? Oh, 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 reflexively, yeah, well, of course I do. Well, sure. But Jesus said the totality of Old Testament revelation is summed up in loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and then loving your neighbor, loving the other, any other, anywhere, as yourself, and doing for them what you would want done for you, and doing to them, in other words, treating them the way that you would want to be treated. There's this underlying respect and compassion there is this tenderness that flows in relationships where love is a priority right if you ask most believers they would say well sure i i love god and the truth is when you look at it experientially and this is this is just evaluation this is just keeping your eyes open this is simply being honest the vast majority of those who claim the name of jesus christ let's be honest loving god is not even on the radar because when you love someone or you love something how do you demonstrate that? What do you do? What do you show? You spend time with them. You, you make them important, a priority, above other things, other people you could be with, other places that you could be. Right? They get the lion's share of your time, your attention, your affection, your heart. That's how we love someone. That's how we demonstrate that love. 
to another. Protection, provision, there are all kinds of things that go into that. Now, obviously, God is our protector and our provider, but the time, the attention, the affection, all those things. If you look at it, listen, um, where you spend most of your time and what you spend most of your time thinking about, in the end, that is your God. Small g, that is your God. So if you ask most believers, well, do you love God? Reflexively, they might say yes, but what bears out in the end is not really a lot of love, but about 15th down the priority list. Just, just somewhere along the lines of a whole lot of other things. I mean, we say, well, I, I love M&Ms, right? I love, <laughs> I love pizza. I love a good steak. I love red wine. I love, yeah, ladies are like, yes, yes. I mean, I'll, you know, could you just go through the, I love all these things. We say that in our society. I mean, whatever we like, we, we say we love, right? Oh, we, it's so wonderful. But listen, there's a, there's what the, there is a, an order to this. At the early church, by the time it got around to speaking Latin, used a term called ordo amor. Ordo amor, the right ordering of the loves. Listen to what I just said. The right ordering of the loves. There's a place for a really good Zinfandel in your order of loves. There's a place for homemade brick oven pizza, right, in your, in your loves. There's a place for these things, but it's not the place that you might give to, say, a pet, right? Shouldn't be. But a pet that you, that you love, and we do, we, we love these animals, and there's something about that. They also, being created, they demonstrate some of, uh, they demonstrate the nature of our God as well. And there's not much more love unconditional than what a dog is willing to offer. Cats, I'm not, a, I'm not one of those weird cat men, so I can't speak to that, but dogs, definitely, right? And you see that in just in creation. It's through, it's through creation that God reveals himself to the world. That's the whole lesson of Romans chapter 1. The world is without excuse. God has been known. His invisible qualities and eternal attributes have been known by what has been made. But listen, how much you love your pet, they, they should not take precedence over your children. I mean, they do sometimes for some people. But they shouldn't. There's a right ordering of the loves. And your, your children genuinely and honestly should not take priority over your spouse, even though in our society, more often than not, they do. And your spouse, as much as you love and care for and, uh, and want to protect them, should not take priority over God. Are you with me? Are you following that? There is a right ordering of the loves. And there's nothing wrong with any of these things. They're all, they're, they're good and holy and right, but they have their place. This is what I want to do, just as I, as I pray to, to open us up here. I want you to remember as we pray. Just take a few moments before God to settle your soul down, confess anything you need to confess, allow him to cleanse and purify you by the blood of the lamb. But I want you to, I want you to think about what he's working on inside your own soul and inside your life right now. What does he want to restore? Now, I can, I can say this about men and women. If this is primarily something that I taught our men over the years, but in the life of every man, at any given point in time, there is, there is something that needs to be dismantled. Usually it's our anger, our drivenness, our, you know, all this stuff, and there is something that needs to be healed. At any given time, I can promise you, at a minimum, those two things are going on. There is something that needs to be dismantled, and there is something that needs to be healed. And I want you just to, just as we pray to go before God, just bow your knee before the throne of his grace, and Whatever it is that he may be working on inside of you, healing, restoring, or redeeming, I just want you to lift it up to him and seek him in this moment. God, what do you want to say to me today? Holy Spirit, how is it that you want to speak to me? How do you want to move? I welcome your power and your presence. Work according to your will. That sound okay? All right. As I pray, you just, uh, you just pray in whatever way you're moved along those lines. Let's ask God to meet us right here where we are. Abba, we are blessed to be in your presence this morning. We're grateful to be alive and to live under the banner of your grace. May you bring the balance that we need this morning, the balance between grace and truth, between wisdom and mercy, between strength and love. May you pour into us. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence and your power. We're not ashamed to say that we are desperately in need. I don't know who I speak for, but I certainly speak for uh, myself and my family, and we are unashamed to say we are desperately in need. We need your covering, your protection. We need your love, Abba, and your mercy and your tenderness. We need your forgiveness and your purity because we can't manufacture these things on our own. Father, I pray for these, your sheep, this morning. You would bring healing, just a taste, a glimpse 
of the healing that's offered. Redemption available in Christ Jesus. Give us a, a taste of transcendence. Move us beyond ourselves for a few moments. Let us bask in your presence. Father, come to us this morning, sons and daughters. Speak to us where we are. Reveal to us where we need to go. Take our hands gently. Lead us. <clears throat> so we began with this uh, anonymous testimony two weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. Marshall, go ahead and give us some lights. We're not going to, just, I want you to listen to the passage because we're actually moving rapidly through this and going, I want to take you into Philippians chapter 3, but we began with Hebrews 11 and verse 7 and this particular testimony that by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, not, not that, but simply respect and obedience, built an ark to save his family. And by his faith, now listen to me, as a result of his profound trust in the justness of God's justice upon an unjust world. The world he was living in was chaotic, filled with violence to the point that God, as you know about the flood, was going to destroy the entire human race and all of its uh, corrupted components. As a result of Noah's profound trust in the justness of God's justice on an unjust world, and in the majesty of God's mercy by warning it for 120 years, which is what Genesis 6-3 tells us, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which comes and can only come by means of faith. This phrase right here led us back to an eternal reality, one deeply embedded in the hearts and minds of the first century faithful, that there is a righteousness revealed by God and given by God which men and women on their own could never conceive and never achieve. This righteousness you cannot work for, labor over, or sweat under. You can't give enough, do enough, or be enough to earn it on your own. And why is this? Because grace is opposed, inherently opposed by its very nature. Grace is opposed to earning and to owing. Now listen, we're talking about the righteousness which comes at the moment of faith in Jesus Christ. We're talking about the righteousness that he gives generously to his children. Grace empowers us uh, in the life of faith. Grace provides for us. Grace is not opposed to, uh, listen, now listen closely, because I'm talking about the life of the children of God here. Grace is not opposed to effort, meaning mental, physical, emotional effort, laboring in the cause of Christ. Grace is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning, to earning. Because if you could, if you could earn it, Abba would owe it, and God is indebted to no one, to no one. Now, I don't want to, I don't, just pause for a moment. Let's don't confuse the issues because I kind of threw something out there that has to do with the way that we walk and the way that we war. It has to do with our lives in Christ. And then the first point was really about our salvation and that, that grace is opposed to earning and to owing. So don't, I don't want to confuse the two. I just wanted to clear that up because we, we came from a background that had this idea that, you know, once you come to Christ and you just sort of sit down in the metaphorical chair of Jesus and God starts doing all kinds of things in you and to you and through you and you don't ever even... You're just kind of like, Ugh, you're there. That's not accurate at all. In fact, one of the words that's used over and over in the New Testament, one of the verbs that's used for when you see someone who, as Paul talks about, uh, working harder than all the rest in the cause of Christ, in Romans chapter 16, he lists an entire, a whole list of a New Testament hall of faith, really, and he says, so-and-so worked hard, and so-and-so worked hard, and usually it's the women. What a surprise. And so-and-so worked hard and worked hard, and, the, and that's... Not a bad term, but here's what it really means. Copiao means to labor to the point of exhaustion. To labor to the point of exhaustion. Are you tracking with that? To labor to the point of exhaustion. What? So that we can make some more money, buy some more stuff? No, in the cause of our king. So that verb alone tells us that in our Christian lives, grace is not opposed to effort. But in salvation, grace is opposed to earning. To earning and to owing. Because if you could earn it, then Abba would owe it. See, this righteousness that's mentioned here is the righteousness that Abba gives graciously and eternally to those who believe on the name of his son. As the ultimate account holder, Abba credits to our bankrupt accounts the perfect righteousness of his only son. To use the theological language, language he imputes to each and every one of us. He imputes or he credits to each and every one of us, his children, the righteousness that his son possesses. This is the basis for how he views us. This is the foundation of our eternal identity. This is the reason our souls are secure. It's not because of what we have done. It's because of what Christ has already accomplished. It's because of the gracious gift of eternal life and perfect righteousness. This is the reason that our souls are secure. It didn't, doesn't, and never will depend on you. And that 
burst the air out of a lot of people's balloons right there. You mean all this good I've done and all these nice things and all the ways that I've acted that this is not, this is not gaining me points with God? The determining factor of your heavenly citizenship, Michael, is your faith, your trust, your belief in the full and finished work of Jesus Christ. Would you, you want proof of that? Read the Gospel of John. Over and over and over again, he brings this idea out that it is believing in the Son of God. Belief in the name of the Son of God. He makes this amazing statement. It's, it's, it's literally amazing at the end of his gospel that if all the things that Jesus had said and done were written down, and he's speaking sort of metaphorically, but he doubts that the whole world could contain the volumes that would be, that would be written. If everything, and I mean, there's a lot in the gospels, in the four gospels, but in John's gospel, there are seven uh, seven major miracles that Jesus performs. There are seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life, etc., etc. So he's got, he, that theme is one in, in scripture of completion, fulfillment, right? When he gets to the end, he says, listen, these things have been written. If everything had been written, you couldn't contain it in the world. But these things have been written that you may believe in the name of the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. By believing, not by working, you may have life in his name. Now, here's the dilemma, <laughs> and it's a big one. It's a big one. Those who feel that they've worked hard enough and long enough, minding their P's and Q's, holding themselves to a rigid and relentless morality, regardless of its scriptural validity, being a good and then throw in whatever, whatever movement, denomination, or background you want, Baptist, Catholic, Independent, Episcopalian, blah, blah, blah. I mean, just go on down the charismatic whatever. Just go on down the line of the various options that are out there in Christianity. Being a good whatever is not necessarily being a follower of Jesus. Following a particular movement in Christianity or denomination or theological system, a se there's a particular system that, I, that, that many of us came out of and that uh, I kind of grew out of, for lack of a better term, uh, theologically, ironically, by simply reading the Bible for itself instead of adhering to merely a system of theology. But being a good whatever, throwing whatever label you want, is not the same as being a follower of Jesus. And simply showing up and being a good attender at a church, wherever that church is, is not the same as loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And here's something that we'll just, let's just throw this in the mix so that we understand the Hebrew idea of a person's strength, when I say, I know what Mike's going to say, but when I say strength, okay, I'm not looking, no, no correct theological answer. When I say strength, what do you think of? Power, about, you know, right? Bench pressing, lifting weights, doing whatever. I mean, when I say strength, be honest. Don't you normally think physical strength? Somebody on, you know, Schwarzenegger in his heyday or whomever, you know? I mean, that's... It's normally where you go. Strength, physical strength. Oh, yeah. Powerful animals, right? Horse, elephant, whatever. I mean, just raw power. Strength. That's not the idea behind that Hebrew concept. Strength for them in an agricultural society was how much land you owned, how much produce came off of it, how many oxen, how many cattle, how many sheep, how many goats, etc., etc. Just going down the line. What a man possessed. So when you love God with all your heart, which is the center of the soul, all your soul, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now we're moving from, right, the innermost part of the soul, from the soul to the spirit to we're moving into the realm of the physical, the material. And this is very, it's a very simple thing. We're moving into the realm, what, what you own, and hopefully doesn't own you, but what you own, what you possess, what's in your bank account, etc., is that surrendered to God. That's, that's the whole issue there. Everything that we have, now listen, just it's very simply, everything we have and everything we are, okay? And is that, that broad enough to, to bring it all in? Everything we have, we possess, and everything that we are as sons and daughters of God. That's what that means. And if you're wondering, well, I don't understand the application, what are you doing with the provision and the resources that God has given you? That's the real application. Because the truth is, in the end, we're, we're, I mean, nobody, nobody, is taking it with him. Nobody. And if you don't use it in the cause of Christ or use it with those you love, you don't make provision for it before you go on to glory. The government will take it. That's pretty much proven by now. They'll get their cut one way or another. 
And especially if you have no will made or no provision, if you haven't done anything with it, they'll take a big cut, a big chunk. That's the way this thing works. And some of you are thinking, well, yeah, I'm never going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're young enough not to, not to go, not to wake up in the morning and go, what happened to my body? Ugh, uh, you know? But listen, it's inevitable. You don't have to die spiritually, and you are not dead eternally. You are alive in Christ Jesus. But this body is going to the grave one day. Or it's just going to fade as it gets transformed in the blink of an eye into one fashioned like Jesus' body. And I dig that because I can't wait to fly. However, what have you done with the resources? What are you doing right now with the resources that God has given you? Listen, you may be brilliant. Uh, you may be beautiful. You may have all kinds of talent. You didn't come by, by way of those things accidentally. Some of it is genetic and some of it is purely a gift from God. These are gifts in life, by the way. They are details in the story. They are not the means of redemption in the story. But in America, they are. You don't have to have any talent at all. You just look good and you're going to get some cachet out of that. If you have a lot of money, you live under a different legal system than the middle class and the poor. If you have a lot of money, you are subject to a different legal system than the rest of us. Now, we don't, we don't like that, and you don't like the fact that I'm talking about it, but that's a reality in the United States. If you have enough money, you can literally get away with murder. If you have enough money, you pay the right people, you, you hire the right attorney, you can get away with just about anything. And that's a sick and sad commentary on our society, but it's real. It's real. But see, you don't have to have necessarily in our society, in, from a cosmic viewpoint, you don't have to have character or integrity or even talent. You just have looks and money. And that, that, uh, that goes a long way in the world. But listen, that all is going to fade in time, right? Unless you die young and leave a good-looking corpse, you're not taking your money or your looks with you, either one of those things. The, the, the Spanish had a proverb that there are no pockets in a funeral shroud. There are no pockets in a funeral shroud. You get that? Nowhere to store anything, right? It's not going with us. Now listen, if we, don't, we, we, talk about, we talk about money and finances and resources less than any church that I have ever known around here. But that's the application of that idea. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It disappoints people who have... I, went, I grew up in a, in, a, in a church, not really, but I spent many years in a church, put it that way. I did my tour of duty or was penalized in a certain amount of time in a church that had its own, basically its own Ten Commandments on the wall. And there were things like, don't dance, don't chew, don't drink, don't go with the girls that do, don't, you know, I mean, literally in addition to whatever the Ten Commandments might be, there were these things on the wall. And by, yeah, I was talking to someone the other day, and she, her story, uh, an older lady is a part of our church, is so similar to mine, there's so many parallels, we both grew up under this kind of legalism, and she rebelled against it, and by the time I was 11 or 12, I was like, well, I kind of broken most of those, and I sort of enjoyed that, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me? So I saw something's wrong with that picture. If that's spirituality, I knew it wasn't salvation because I, I already knew God through faith in Jesus Christ. I, I came up earlier as a child in a church that taught the Word of God. So I knew that. But I couldn't differentiate. I couldn't make the distinction at that time. Well, what is this that I'm seeing? And, uh, and why is it that if we have a, a rule about tobacco, why, why are all these guys out front? It was a kind of a small country church chewing and smoking at break. I don't, what's going on? Can we do that? Can that, you know? So we couldn't get away with that, right? So listen, uh, the point is, by the time I was about 12, I said, well, that's not, I can't do that. So I'm out of here. It was not just the legalism, Joni, it was the hypocrisy, right? People who hold themselves to a, a rigid and relentless morality, regardless of whether it's scripturally valid, to earn their place in Abba's kingdom, who by virtue of their superior virtue are worthy of this perfect righteousness, what happens when they hear about grace is they are now robbed of the entire complex upon which they've built their lives and based their behaviors. And paradigms like this don't shift easily. For one's worldview to be radically realigned means the old world has to fade so the new one can come into focus. When you've built your foundation on the sand of self-righteousness and it suddenly shifts into the breach you go. Legalists the world over from antiquity to post-modernity start to sweat when there's no fear, Dana, associated with our redemption. No whip to crack, no stick hiding behind the carrot of the cross, no sweating and straining to secure our self-worth, no laboring for and earning our standing before God. I'm just, I can just imagine 
this conversation going on. How are we going to herd people into our particular pen, right? Be it, it doesn't matter whether that pen is moral, spiritual, ethical, or denominational. How are we going to get them in line and keep them in line? And if you think that there's not this kind of control and tyranny going on in churches, mega churches with thousands and small churches as well, you don't understand the nature of man and you don't understand the nature of religion. It's always about control and primarily about power. Just like what we see in the political realm, it's about power, getting it and keeping it at all cost. And people will do just about anything once they've got it to keep it. They will hold on to power. There is a huge difference in leadership in any realm, business, social, political, between power and authority. And I want you to listen to me. Between power and authority. Because power can be abused. Power can be manipulated. Power can be coerced. Power can be bought with the right amount of money. Authority is what you earn by the weight of your own life and the content of your character. There is an enormous difference between power and authority. Power coerces. Power drives. By the way, if you, if you are a shepherd, especially in the flock of God, you can't drive sheep, as skittish and fearful as they are. And you can't drive human beings in the end. Now, if they, unfortunately, we have a lot of people in the United States that appear to want to be slaves, and they can be herded. But you, can't, you can't drive sheep. You have to lead them. And you have to lead them by the sound of your voice. You have to lead them by love. Love, grace, truth, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. How are we going to get people in line and keep them in line? That's a question that gets asked when people are trying to hold on to power. <clears throat> it would serve us well if we remembered those two things when we look at in the political realm, we looked at people in business, bosses, when we look at our shepherds, our evangelists, our teachers in the body of Christ. Is this, is this power or is this authority? What are they wielding and what does this person seem to be about? What do they care most about? Is it attendance in buildings and cash, the ABCs of modern Christianity, or is it the hearts of people? And there is a difference. And you have the discernment to be able to tell the difference between the two. You have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. You have the wisdom of His Word. Use it. Use it. You can only be deceived if you want to buy a lie of some kind. Now, sometimes, oftentimes, we get, we get deceived. We get blindsided by something. But once you know the truth, right, then you can be set free from the lie. Once you see that you are in a... In, circumstance of some kind where it's all about power, control, tyranny, intimidation, etc., etc. Once you see that, once you've absorbed all the self-hatred that you can take, once you realize, you know what, this is not really me. I, I don't think I'm the problem here. I think this culture is the problem. I think that this, this leadership is the problem, something else. Again, once you've made a legitimate assessment that the Holy Spirit is in, and you see that the situation, whether it's a relationship or, a, again, a relationship or a Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's something else. you got to make a choice now. Do I want to live under this? If you're in a spiritual environment like that that's toxic, I would say to you, since there's no legal obligation whatsoever, to run. To run fast. Because there are a lot of toxic churches out there and a lot of toxic leaders holding on to power. There's a difference. Power drives. Authority leads. And authority simply says, listen, I know the way because I've been there before. And if you want to come along... I'll lead you. And if you don't, I'm not going to force you. That's the difference between power and authority. Power says you will. Authority says, would you like to? I'd love for you to. And takes you by the hand. And there's a difference between the two. If there's no fear or worry or anxiety over their identity, how will we ever control them? How will we control them? How will we, or how will God, rather, right? Let's, let's make it spiritual. Get them to behave. Let me tell you how. With infinite grace. Tons of truth and limitless love. That's how God gets us to behave. With infinite grace. Tons of truth, right? To break the power of the lies that we've bought into. And limitless love, that's how. We live in love as the royalty we are in response to these precious gifts, or we don't. See, control is our crutch, not God's. Our God is the author of freedom. The freest being to ever exist. And he graced us with that same freedom. Control is our crutch. Listen to me closely. The freedom of Jesus' followers is not in our hands or under our authority and never will be. It's not in our hands. It's not under our authority to control other people as if that were even possible, and it never will be. Now, on the flip side, here's the flip side of that. Scripturally saving faith is not and never has been mere passive assent to an intellectual idea. It is actively staking one's life, actively staking one's life 
all we have and all we are on the claims of Abba in his word. And this, my friends, is a certainty and assurance sufficient to radically rearrange our scale of values and to alter eternally the course of our lives. And this is what I would call the stark raving reality on both ends of the equation. That one, you will never control people, no matter how much fear and intimidation you push their way. You'll never control people. And two, those who believe in the God of love and the love of God will serve him faithfully, faithfully, because they love to, Cindy, not because they have to. That's an enormous difference in motivation. Motive is the deepest level of holiness available to us. Why we do what we do by way of service and sacrifice, why we don't do what we don't do by way of sin and selfishness. Are you following that? You with me? Motive is the deepest level of holiness we have. Why we do what we do out of love for God by way of service, sacrifice, etc., and why we don't do, Jennifer, what we don't do by way of sin and selfishness and arrogance and maybe even criminality. That's the deepest level we have available to us. Those who believe in the God of love and the love of God, they will serve him faithfully because they love to, not because they have to. Amen on that? Anybody want to shout like hallelujah or somewhere along the line? I mean, that's freedom. Now, let me show you something. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to weave these two concepts together. And probably what we're going to do right now is set the stage for, uh, for next week. Philippians chapter 3. I want to begin in verse 1. I want to look at the first eight verses. And really what we want to head to is verse 9 as a key, Kim. But there is so much here. I mean, I have from, from years past, uh, I taught the book of Philippians probably early 2000s in Arkadelphia. And I go back and look at these, at these various sections. Um, I've got it broken down in, chap- in this chapter, verses 1 through 3, and then 4 through 7, and then, you know, uh, 8 and 9, I think, and a couple of just different, broken down different sections, and I've got like 20 and 23 pages of notes on each one of these. I mean, I, I just look at the way that I put things together then versus the way I do it now, and uh, <laughs> I'm just like, wow, man. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. I mean, there was a, I've got tons and tons. So when I get ready to teach something like this, I just go back and read through those notes, gather it all, and try to stuff it into the sponge of the brain, and then see if I can regurgitate some of it here. Okay, chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. That phrase, finally, is not the end of the letter. It's not like when uh, you get to maybe a uh, particular preacher or pastor or something that says, and the last point, and then gives you 10 more. That's not what Paul's doing. Okay, finally, toloipon is the phrase, and here's what it means. It means for the duration, for the duration, for the duration of of what? The rest of this uh, particular message, a a Bible class, a worship service, what are we talking about? For the duration of your lives. It means from now on, Chris, from now on. From now on in the battle, rejoice in the Lord. For the duration of your life in this conflict, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. So he's writing the same things, and he had already written them what? Before. If he's writing them again, then he wrote them once before. I mean, that's pretty pretty plain. It's no trouble for me to do this, and notice it is a safeguard for you. It's a guardianship for your souls. Now, we live in an age that delights in the novel and the new. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We want new technology. We want faster. We want, I mean, we just keep... Spinning the wheel for better, bigger, better, badder, all the rest of it. And the novel and the new that always gains an audience, always gains a crowd. The problem is we may eat those, uh, those white-collar foods when we go out, right? I mean, we get whatever it is, something rich, something whatever, but we survive on, you know, basic necessities mostly. The things that are going to nourish our bodies more than whatever this extravagant meal is. I love, I like to eat. And I think most people probably do, and especially in our country, we can see that. Uh, I'll give you an example. We were in Eureka Springs um, about two weeks ago, and the first night we went to Gaskins, which is a steak place. So steak and, you know, oh, big, delicious meal. The next night we went to Ermelio's, which is an Italian restaurant. It's fantastic. It's up at the top of Spring Street. If you wind your way around and head back, it goes up and out towards Eureka Springs Little Hospital, which is about as big as this church building. And, uh, and then it comes out on 62. But it's just a, it's just a house up at the top of Spring Street. And it's fantastic. And it, I mean, it was like, 
wow, why, why do we not know about this place? How do we, you know, how do we miss this one? You know, been up there half a dozen times. And so, you know, we got two nights, and we're, we're, we're kind of doing picnics during the day and stuff like that. And, but two nights in a row, so by the third night, it's our last night there, you know, getting ready to go, and Lynn's watching the news and sitting on the edge of the bed, and I said, I have no idea. I, I, I don't know what. I mean, I, I feel like I haven't eaten in hours, and I just feel like I'm just like, oh, you know, like, uh, I have no taste for anything. I, mean, I know once we got somewhere, I would have enjoyed it, whatever it was. We'll go somewhere, and we'll have a <clears throat> beverage and, you know, whatever. It'll be good, but I was just like, I have no, I don't even know what. I mean, these were two big, really rich meals, and I mean, I, again, I like to eat, but I just had no, I was like, I have no, I have no suggestion whatsoever. And she goes, well, I'm exhausted. I said, well, since I, I know Eureka Springs like the back of my hand, I said, well, I'll tell you what, I know that there is a subway right, right up here around the corner. And I said, I'll go get you what you want. I'll go by somewhere and get what I want. And, uh, and you know, bring it back here. And she was like, is there something wrong with us that we're, we're sitting in all last night up here that we're not going somewhere? And I was like, no, I, don't, I think we're fine. I think it's called exhaustion, you know. I just, I mean, literally, I had no haste for anything at that point. I was just like, I don't, I have no idea. I don't know, right? Listen, Paul says, you may have heard this before. And this is a, there's a very, this is a very simple point. I'm, I'm sharing these things with you again. I'm writing them to you again, the same things. It's not a problem for me. It's a guardianship for your souls. It's a safeguard for you. There's a very simple point. This is totally like a side note to where we're going, but repetition, repetition. It's absolutely essential in sound Bible teaching. It is absolutely essential. Because nobody, nobody, nobody gets it all the first time. And in any given moment, in any given worship service, there are, believe me, there are about a thousand things. My brain's firing off on all levels. There's about a thousand things going on. And there may be something that comes out that the Holy Spirit just moves and motivates in that moment. And if you're not keyed in, you're going to miss it. And if, you don't, if, you don't, if you're not going back or maybe listening to it again or jotting down a note or doing something, you're going to miss it. And uh, that's just the nature of the beast. So good teaching, it doesn't matter what it is, finds a way to, uh, to reframe, restate, right? Shift things up a little bit, maybe change a word or two here in a point or a principle and bring it back out again another time because we need those things. Nobody gets it all the first time. And we need them taught to us to the point that not only do they soak into our own souls and make their way into experience, but that we can also share them with somebody else as we walk in them. It's, it's important to us. And God makes it a point. And here's Paul saying, listen, this is important for you. And then he goes on to say, watch out. Three times we have beware, beware, beware. Watch out. It's not repeated in the NIV, but it's there in the Greek. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Like, wow, that's Ooh, what? That's strong language. He's not, he's not just talking about, he's not talking about your general category of sinners. He's talking about those who are mutilating the gospel of grace, Stephanie. He's talking about people who had, uh, men who had come out of a background of Judaism and who had become believers, but now these Jews are trying to take a law that they themselves cannot even keep and impose it on the Gentiles. If you go back in the book of Acts, you see that there are men who are demanding of the Gentiles that they be circumcised in order to be saved. And they're called, they're just the term that we use to describe these people who battled the Apostle Paul all the time, they're called Judaizers. Judaizers. The party of the Jews. And this is who he's dealing with in Philippi. I and mean, this is all over. This is what the book of Galatians is, is combating constantly. But now we're out here in Philippi. Right? So we've, we've crossed the Hellespont into Greece. And... Um, and here's this same thing coming up again. Watch out for those dogs. And you say, well, dogs, I love my dog. It's just so wonderful. And dog in the ancient world, is, is a, that's an epithet. It is the lowest animal. Scavengers in the street. They feed, on, they feed on the garbage. They feed on dead bodies. They feed on whatever's out there. And that is not, that it is, that's not like, oh, it's a wonderful look. They, he called me a dog. It's not that. And David says to Saul, who have you come out to find? Right? A dead dog, single flea. I mean, he's minimizing himself. Why are you searching all over Israel and traversing through the mountains and the valleys to find what? A dead dog? And what are you after here? This is not a, uh, this is not a pretty term, and it's used in some pretty abusive ways. It's a way of you question someone's manhood, 
He questioned their very legitimacy by calling them a dog. This is an insult to the highest caliber. So for all of those uh, who say, well, you know, Christian spirituality is just, it's just nicey-nice all the time. I would say it's better to be nice than not. I would say it's even better to be kind and know that the Holy Spirit's in that. Phrase, that phrase, by the way, it's all over the internet now. It's not new, and it's not by some uh, Facebook philosopher. It is Philo of Alexandria in the century prior to Christ. He tried to take uh, Jewish theology and, and Greek philosophy and meld them together. I'm saying good luck with that, bro. But, that, but that's what he did. And his phrase, Chris, was be kind. And you know where it's coming. You, you've seen this on Facebook. Be kind for everyone you know is facing a great battle. That's not a Facebook philosopher. That, that irritates me when I see these quotes out there with flowers all around them and stuff like that. Know where it comes from and what the intention was. It was meant to be intensely spiritual when it was first offered. Now it's just kind of a platitude. So I would say, yes, it's better to be, better to be kind than not. But the whole idea, listen, these are enemies who are distorting the gospel of grace. I feel like calling people dogs and, and, uh, and um, men who do evil and mutilators of the flesh. When I see what we saw up in, up in Eureka Springs, there's only 20 channels on the TV and three of them were religious. And one of them is Daystar and they had, some, they had a special guest on there to ask for money. Plant, plant a certain amount of seed per month for this next year and blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. Then the other one has a guy from Ohio, and I don't know his name, but he's, he's, he's out there on TV all the time. It's Rod something. But it's always, it's always about harvesting money, planting a seed, sowing the crop, re reaping your harvest, all the rest of this. And he's talking about, and I said, I said, just watch, honey. Give it about a minute and a half. It took about 90 seconds in, maybe two minutes before the first mention of, you know, planting this seed in 30, 60, 100 fold. Oh, God's just going to, I mean, all, all of this stuff. And then there's another channel, which looked like it looked like somebody had built a little, a little bar. Uh, it looked like a, a very poorly produced talk show, an independent cable channel. And there's four people up there. There's two, two men and two women. And there's a doctor, and he's talking about health and talking about juicing, and he's it's a Christian channel, and he's, he's hawking a juicer. He's selling a juicer on this show. And the woman next to him starts talking about how the three type of men you shouldn't marry, you know? The guy who doesn't work, and the guy who's abusive, and the guy who's something else. I'm like, you know, that's not a distinctly Christian concept, sweetheart. That's called common sense, right? When you see that guy, you run, right? Unless you're blind to reality, but here she is, and here he is, and then over on the other side, there's another woman, and she's talking about the blood moon and the latter days and some of this stuff, and then and there's a guy in the middle, and I'm like, I've seen that guy before. He's got, you know, he got gray hair and a beard and glasses, and I see a scroll come across the bottom, the Jim Baker Network. You remember him? I'm like, sweet sons of monkeys. This, this is a circus. This is a circus. I feel the same way. I feel... Listen, if you, were, if you if, just imagine that all you know, just think about this. Imagine all you know of Christianity is seeing that on TV. Those three things. I mean, you've, tur you've turned to three different channels hoping to hear a word from God. I mean, you're thinking, well, uh, I don't know. I, I don't have God in my life, so may maybe some television preacher can show me God. And so you flip through these channels. And you see one guy talking about harvesting, you know, if you'll just send your money and harvesting this money back, and somebody else basically saying the same thing in a different way, and then somebody selling juicers <laughs> under a blood moon with a bad man sitting next to him, right? I mean, uh, you know, the, the bad guy who's abusive or whatever. I mean, you'll be like, that's crazy. That's nuts, <laughs> right? I mean, you, would, would you want that? Would you say, boy, that, that Jesus, I mean, what a juicer, right? <laughs> would would you find any hope if you were broken and hurting and on your knees before the television? Would that bring you hope in any way? And let's say you don't have any money to send. Well, what do I do now? Because I'm not going to get 30 or 60 or 100 fold back. I have no money. Now what? What do I do? Right? Maybe they'll send me a magic handkerchief and I can, you know, wipe it all over myself and everything will be good. I mean, that, that type of stuff makes me bilious right there at best. That's exactly exactly the kind of distortion that Paul is dealing with when he uses language like dogs, men who do evil, meaning they are under the influence of the enemy, and mutilators of the flesh. They are a false circumcision, is what he says. 
For it is we who are the circumcision. The true circumcision, by the way. And then he, said, and then he describes it. We who worship by, by means of the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence. Three things he used to describe the true circumcision. We worship by means of the Spirit. We glory in the Son of God. And we put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. Why would that be important? Because proselytes to Judaism as adults were circumcised as full-grown men. Proselytes to Judaism, right? Um, Ishmaelites, who were sons of Abraham by Hagar, his Egyptian concubine, they were circumcised in their 13th year. But Jews were circumcised on the eighth day. On the eighth day. What he's saying is, I was born. Now listen, he's, these guys who are distorting the gospel of grace, they have also come out of Judaism. Are you following me? They have come out of this as well. And they are, they are uh, making the law and making certain requirements from the law or certain ceremonies of the law, requirements for salvation, for spirituality, etc. And Paul's saying, listen, you want to boast in the flesh? Do you want to boast about some things? And he lists seven things for us. He lists seven things, the first four of which have, they have no volitional merit. In other words, he didn't do anything for these. These things were a part of his heritage and his background. He was born with these. But he says, if you want to boast in the flesh, oh, you want to boast? I've got some things that I can show you here. And he starts with that. And what he's saying is, I was born into the Jewish faith, and I have known its promises, privileges, and observed its ceremonies since birth. Can you say that, Judaizers? Of the people of Israel. When a Jew wanted to stress the unique nature of his relationship to Yahweh, he used the term Israelite, Ron. Israelite. Because, remember, Jacob's brother Esau, his descendants were the Edomites. And the Edomites could trace their lineage back to to Isaac. Um, The Ishmaelites, their sons of Abraham, right, by Hagar, they can trace their lineage back back to him. He also had several sons by a, a wife named Keturah. Those became the Arabian tribes. They can trace their lineage back to Abraham, but only the Jew could trace, trace his descent back to, back to Israel, back to Jacob, of the people of Israel. You know what this is? The purity of lineage? That's racial arrogance. Racial arrogance. We don't see any of that in the United States these days, do we? Racial arrogance. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Thank God that his father intervened at his birth. You know what his name was originally? Benoni, meaning son of my pain. Nobody wants to be named son of my mother's pain. I can promise you. Nobody wants that name. Benyamin means son of my right hand, right? And it's the source, that's the source of strength and power. I like that name. That's a warrior's name, son of my right hand. Son of my mother's pain, man, that's, that's a curse for life, Jack, right? That is a curse of the tribe of Benjamin. Why is that important? Where did the first king of Israel come from? What tribe? Saul. Where did he come from? One woman knows this. Come on. Benjamin, right? The very first king. This is an elite tribe. They were aristocracy in Israel. They were one of only two tribes that were not taken away in the Assyrian captivity. The ten northern tribes were captured there. Uh, Ultimately, they were taken away in a Babylonian captivity, but when they return out of Babylon, uh, it's Benjamin and Judah, the two southern tribes. By the way, Benjamin stayed loyal to Judah when the nation split. So there there, there are many things about this tribe uh, that were important. They were leaders on the field of battle. In fact, the battle cry was, behind you, O Benjamin. In other words, you lead the way, and we will follow. This is, this is kind of an elitist attitude. It's, it's what we might call a genetic arrogance. A Hebrew of Hebrews. There were various dispersions of the Hebrew people in the ancient world, and when they went out into, uh, that's called, they were called diasporas, right? Dispersions. When they were sent out by God, they were uh, in captivity to Assyria in 721 B.C. and a captivity to Babylon in 586 B.C., but then over the course of time into Greek and Roman culture. By the the time Paul writes this, the Romans had conquered the world militarily and the Greeks had conquered it culturally and linguistically. And oftentimes where the Jews went, they took upon themselves Greek culture and Greek language. And it conflicted strongly with uh, their worship of Yahweh. And sometimes, sometimes it was merely a matter of just learning the language, not necessarily taking the customs or culture, but you had to be able to speak Koine Greek. Paul says, listen, my ancestors, they are all Hebrews of Hebrews. There are no Hellenistes 
among them. You remember in Acts chapter 6 when the early church has a, a division because the Hebrew widows are being served uh, food and the Greek-speaking uh, Jews are not? That's, that word is Hellenistes. Paul says, there are no Hellenistes among my family members. He spoke Greek and spoke it well, but our people retain their culture. That is a cultural arrogance. We don't see any of that in the United States either, do we? Now, just follow with me. We're, we're just going to finish what he says down to verse 7. Boom, we're going to pick up next week in, in that and move on. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. A Pharisee. Now, you're all familiar with the Pharisees and the Gospels for the most part if you've read it at all. The Greek word pharisaios means the separated ones, those who had separated themselves from the rest of the nation. They believed that they were more holy. They were farther up the ladder. I mean, there was no, these are the greatest legalists of all time. These are the, these are the Navy SEALs of Judaism in the first century. There's never more than 6,000 in the nation at any given point in time. They are doctors of the law. They are the elite of the elite. When you talk about people who are Bible scholars, when you talk about serious students of the word, when you talk about people who had submitted and subordinated every aspect of their lives to the word of God, you're talking about Pharisees. And this is what some of us have done over the years. We have made that a priority. And that's not the problem. That's not the problem. The problem was they missed the living word when he stood in their presence. And they made ritual Ritual, Mickey, more important than reality. That's the problem. Paul was a Pharisee. To the entrance exam, you might call it, for a young man to become a Pharisee was to memorize the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Have you ever read the first five books of the Old Testament? It's tough to get through some of it. They memorized those scrolls in Hebrew. That's a rather amazing feat. That is intellectual and educational arrogance. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Zeal was the thing that set apart one Jew from another. That was the most important part of their worship. They didn't believe in anybody being apathetic and indifferent. That was not a part of Judaism. Either, you either were on fire or you were just whatever. But no apathy, no indifference. If you go back to Galatians 1, which you can read on your own, you will see Paul saying, I was advancing farther than any of my contemporaries in Judaism. My zeal was unsurpassed. So he has, he has a right to say, look at all these things. Look at all of these things. Listen, you guys can't match that. My zeal was so great that I persecuted the church of God. As for legalistic righteousness, in other words, in regards to the Mosaic law, I was faultless. Persecuting the church, you know what that is? That's religious arrogance. And you know what this last one is? Faultless as far as, as, far as legalism is concerned? What it means, blameless or faultless, is that nobody could lay a charge against him. He had an impeccable reputation. As, uh, under Judaism, nobody could bring a charge against him. It doesn't mean he was sinless, does it? It doesn't mean he was perfect. It just means nobody could make it stick. He was a Teflon Pharisee. Nobody could bring a charge. Some of you other guys, yeah, maybe, but not me. Whatever things, but whatever was to my profit, my gains, plural, I now consider loss, singular, for the sake of Christ. We're using that passage there as a springboard, again, to the righteousness which comes from God and is given by means of faith. That whole thing. Listen, he's battling people who said, you have, to, you have to live according to the law. You have to be circumcised. You have to embrace the ceremonies of Judaism in order to be spiritual. You have to be circumcised in order to be saved, and on and on and on. All this other stuff. And he's, he's saying, listen, if anybody, had, if anybody could glory in their background religiously, it would be me. And if you follow that passage far enough, and we will next week, he's going to say all of these things, whatever things were profits to me in the flesh, whatever were gains to me, plural, I consider them loss, singular, for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus. And what's more, I've added up all of my background, all of my achievements, all my religiosity, and I consider it to be, what a kind word, rubbish, rubbish. It's a plural word. Josh, it means piles of dung. That's your literal translation. Paul would rather you get offended by it than not hear what he was saying. Get that. Get it. All of this stuff that was a part of my background, I consider it to be piles of dung because it's nothing. It's nothing compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Listen, that's all grace, pure grace. That is grace upon grace upon grace. And that's what God has offered to you here this morning. Marshall, what I want to do is pray for you. And we're going to have uh, a couple of our men come up here. Ron, Paul, a few others. Ron Paul. Hmm. I wish he was here. I uh, love Ron Paul. And we're just going to have a few of our guys come up here and be available. If you would like us to pray with you, 
Well, listen, we're, we're, we're offering. If you would like us to pray for you in any way, shape, or form, whatever's going on with you, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, again, our God is a healer, and our God is a restorer, and we believe that. I love you, and we'll see you next time. Father, we're grateful for the day. We're grateful for this opportunity to celebrate the lives of so many. We have, we have three birthdays right here this day. And we, we celebrate those lives, whether, it was a, whether it's the day of their birth or not, um, they're worth celebrating simply because of who they are and who you created them to be. One young man who's, uh, who's growing up, who has uh, a good mother figure in his life to show him and to teach him about reality, about truth, about honor, about conviction. And two ladies of grace, one young lady who is, who, whose parents I know glory in her character and her honor. The other lady, the one that I love more than any person on the face of this earth, she is the finest lady of grace I've ever known. Father, you've blessed us with some wonderful people, and you've poured out your power upon them. I pray that not only their lives, but the lives of everyone here this morning would be enriched by your grace and your goodness, that they would sense your power and know that you are you are for them and not against them. You are with them, and you desire nothing but the best. You discipline us at times, but you strengthen us as well. You redirect our path to the right, uh, in the right direction, but you do it as a shepherd, not as a controller, a manipulator, a tyrant. I praise you and we honor you for your, your love as a father for each of us as sons and daughters. I pray that our hearts would be humbled by that, that we would say thank you, thank you, thank you. We bless you. We praise you. We would shout hallelujah for the righteousness that has come as a gift of grace, the righteousness which is pure in your sight, which comes by means of faith that you give freely to all of us, that you impute and credit to our bankrupt accounts. We are honored to be a part of your family. Thank you, sir. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.